it really is Dr. Schiller has really, really led um, this movement. And I was sort of reflecting back upon our history because it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish uh, and kind of where we, we started at sort of humble beginnings. So I was going to kind of share that history with you and then talk a little bit about the three things I think have, have made major advances for lung cancer care over the past 20, 25 years. Um, so I was a fellow at Duke and when I was doing my fellowship, I started off on uh, the bone marrow transplant unit. At that time we were doing bone marrow transplants for people with breast cancer. Um, and so I was in the intensive care unit day after day with these young women who had gotten transplanted and they were dying and their babies were on their beds and it was just, oh. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to do breast cancer research. <laughs> um, and then my next rotation was GI oncology. And I was dealing with people who were bleeding to death and vomiting up blood. And it, you know, it was just like, oh, no, 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 this isn't for me either. Um, and at that time, our chair had taken uh, a sabbatical. And Dr. Jeffrey Crawford was um, filling in as the chair of the department. So I went to Dr. Crawford and I said, look, I can't really figure out what I want to do. And I was kind of interested in sickle cell anemia. And I was kind of interested in, in a lot of things. And he said, well, I think you should do lung cancer because he was a lung cancer specialist. And I said, oh, OK. Well, that sounds interesting. It's like, come hang out in clinic and, and you know, we'll, we'll take care of lung cancer patients. So I went to his clinic and I started taking care of people with lung cancer. And I really, really connected with it. it um, it was a disease that required a lot of critical thinking. Um, there were some interesting areas of research because at that time we had one drug for people with lung cancer and radiation and surgery. That was it. Um, and so I got really involved and I really loved what I was doing. And I started looking around and, and there, were all, there was all this advocacy. This is when advocacy first kind of started. Um, there was all this advocacy for breast cancer. And, and I couldn't figure out why there was any advocacy for, advocacy for lung cancer. And one day I was walking down the hall and there was this big poster and it said Alcase on it. And Alcase was a lung cancer advocacy group. Um, and it has now morphed into Lung Cancer Alliance and they've actually merged with Bonnie Adario's foundation. Um, but I'm like, I am going to advocacy that's what we need we need advocates we need people to bring awareness to lung cancer and spread the word um, about how uh, serious this illness is and how anyone can get lung cancer um, it was interesting because Al case started you know the whole ribbon thing started with the red ribbon for HIV um, and Al case had a lung cancer ribbon and our ribbon was clear it was this clear plastic invisible ribbon because we were the invisible disease and you couldn't even see it on your clothes <laughs> I mean it was kind of a you know interesting idea but uh, I thought wow you know we have an invisible ribbon that no one can even see um, and we really are kind of the invisible disease and so in the background at that time I also noticed that in I was reviewing some SEER data uh, for a talk, and in 1987, lung cancer surpassed breast cancer as the leading cancer killer of women. Okay, now I'm in my fellowship, so this was, you know, like 92, 93. I'm like, why, why aren't bells going off about this? I mean, this is a major trend. Breast cancer, lung cancer has surpassed breast cancer as the number one cancer killer of women, and no one knows this. No one knows this. And then I would see these, uh, you know, we'd have conferences for women's malignancies. And it would be breast cancer and cervical cancer and skin cancer and thyroid cancer, but no lung cancer, even though it was the number one cancer killer of women. And there was this huge educational gap. And, and it just struck me as very, very odd. Um, and then this email comes from Dr. Schiller, <laughs> who uh, basically said, look, you know, lung cancer is a woman's disease. There's no information about this. The public isn't aware of this. You know, um, it seems that in some situations, and again, this is very early on in the, our careers, but that lung cancer in women may be different from lung cancer in men. 
Um, and so Dr. Schiller put together a group of us at, an, at, at our big annual meeting, ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. We all met up. Um, she organized it. And as I think back to that first meeting now, there were truly giants in lung cancer research uh, at that meeting. Of course, Dr. Schiller is one of them. Um, so I think, you know, Dr. Schiller uh, has had many papers, but she's probably most famous for her four-armed trial ECOG study looking at different platinum-based combinations and their efficacy. Dr. Kathy Pisters was there. Dr. Bonnie Glisson, MD Anderson, was there. Dr. Pisters is MD Anderson as well. Uh, Lori Gas Dr. Lori Gaspar was there, a famous radiation oncologist. Dr. Karen Kelly was there, who did, again, some groundbreaking work using radiation and even targeted therapies um, for the treatment of inoperable lung cancer. Dr. Kathy Albane was there, who did a landmark study um, looking at uh, bimodality therapy using chemotherapy and radiation versus chemo radiation and surgery for lung cancer patients. Dr. Jill Siegfried, an expert in smoking and estrogen, was there. Um, and Dr. Julie Bramer, who um, led the first trial with Optivo or nivolumab, the phase one studies that really broke open the dikes for uh, lung cancer care. So I think back to that and, and you know, these women were, are truly giants. I mean, these, these women are at the old man in the sea <laughs> for lung cancer research. Um, and so it was really amazing. So we decided after our original meeting that yes, we did want to move forward. We did want to do something. And so we had, you know, we had no funding. We had nothing except for energy, I guess, and a little creativity and, and a lot of expertise. And so we organized this organization called Women Against Lung Cancer. Um, and we worked very hard um, and grew and we had annual meetings and ultimately that morphed into the Lung Cancer Partnership um, and then Free to Breathe and now Free to Breathe has now um, gotten together with another organization um, and lo and behold, suddenly we have major lung cancer advocacy programs. Um, so that was, you know, that was really, really an amazing start. and. Um, you know, we would frequently muse when we would sit around at these meetings and kind of, you know, these were the major thought leaders in the field. And one thing that we frequently would say is, you know, we're, we're 15 years behind breast cancer research. Um, what do we need to move forward? Uh, and one of the biggest things we needed was funding. We needed funding, we needed people to take us seriously. Again, I mean, these, are, these were major women in academic research fields, and that's not always an easy thing. Um, but we figured out how to overcome those boundaries, and I'm just really proud of our organization today as, as things have, have evolved. So when I think back to three major changes that I think advocates have made a major uh, impact on, um, and that's what our summit's about. We're going to brainstorm ways for people to truly be effective. And we want to reach every corner of North Carolina. I want to reach every community, every county, you know, everybody. Because anyone can get lung cancer. Um, and if you look around our room, we're just a beautifully diverse group here. So we really want to reach everyone uh, with a message. So one of the things I think that advocates have made a major impact on is research. Um, we started including advocates when we designed clinical trials. We've started including advocates and patient representatives on IRBs. Um, and I think now we really have a voice at the table as, as advocates. And I think social media has been huge, YouTube, all this has been very big in, in our evolution. Um, I'm really, really thrilled <clears throat> to see, you know, you click around YouTube these days and, and you know, there are people who may not have even graduated from, from college or may not even have a science background. In fact, I find it very in interesting that there are tons of like engineers who are very, very interested in health and health outcomes and biohacking and figuring out how to optimize our health. Um, but it's just really interesting that, that medical research is now accessible to 
anyone. You know, before we had all our academic papers were sort of siloed in PubMed and you had to be affiliated with the university, have access to those things. But now anyone can get these papers and read them and think strategically about how to move forward and how to change things. And I think that's just amazing. Um, I remember when our kids were young, there was a huge oil spill, and uh, someone came to my son's third day grade class, and they brainstormed with the kids about how to clean up this oil spill. And I mean, the creativity of children, they have, they have none of these societal, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this, they have none of these barriers. Um, and you know, the ways they figured out to clean up this oil spill were incredibly creative. And so I think about that when you start thinking about people outside of medicine who use their energy and their skill sets and their passion to help solve a problem. It's, it's truly amazing. So in terms of research, yes, we've got more investment. The DOD used to only give uh, grant money to breast cancer research. Okay, this is our Department of Defense, but now they give money to lung cancer and prostate cancer and other things. Um, and what's come out of this research? Well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we used to have basically three tools in our toolkit. It was chemotherapy, radiation, uh, and surgery. Uh, but now we have targeted therapies. So if tumors have a little target on them, we can use a heat-seeking missile to literally, you know, put it in the body and it swims around and finds the target and kills it. And those are pills. I mean, that's, I remember the first study we did with ERISA. Um, you know, and you do a lot of clinical trials and you do early phase studies and, and you, you try to get your hopes up, but you don't really expect a lot. And I remember I had a patient on it and she was coming in for her first scans and I put up her scan and then I put up her second scan, you know, her follow-up treatment scan, and it looked like a different person. <laughs> and I remember saying, is that the same? Do I have, you know, because back then people, you could mix up labels on x-rays. And so I checked the name. Yes, that's the same person. I like check the contour of the body on the x-ray. I'm like, gosh, that's the same person. This pill really works. Um, and we knew nothing about, we didn't even know about the EGFR mu uh, marker, much less mutation then. We just knew that there was this population of patients, frequently women who'd never smoked, that this pill worked really great in. Um, so I, I, I remember those days. Um, moving forward to genetic profiling. So we now can customize treatments. If I have to give chemotherapy these days, I almost feel like I've let the patient down. Like that is my least happy option for people. Um, I want to find a target. I want to find a mutation. Um, we've got EGFR. We've got ALG. ROS1, again, was discovered and um, uh, Dr. Alice Shaw has done most of the work with uh, the ROS1 mutation, BRAF, MET. Um, all these mutations now we can, we can target with pills. The second thing that's happened is immunotherapy. And again, when I think back to my fellowship, um, we knew immunotherapy worked in uh, renal cell carcinoma and melanoma, we knew the immune system um, was effective in those, those diseases, and there's a lot of work in that area. But lung cancer patients were too sick. They were too sick. They didn't have any immune system because, you know, they had a lot of medical problems. And so no one really thought that sick stage four lung cancer patients could mount an immune response that would do anything. And everybody knows the immune system couldn't, like, wipe out cancer. I mean, that's, that's impossible. Our drugs are better than that, right? That was the thinking at the time. Um, so I, we had a signal, at least personally, I had a signal that the immune system might actually be a major um, force when one of my colleagues had a vaccine trial. And his vaccine targeted CEA, which is usually seen in colon cancer, um, but is also seen in some lung cancer, um, lung cancers express CEA. And I had a couple of patients who got this vaccine and they remained in remission for long periods of time. Um, you know, and, and so I thought maybe there is something here, you know, even though these people are, have a lot of medical problems, it seems that 
we are somehow manipulating the immune system and at least keeping their cancer from growing and spreading. Um, but then um, we identified um, you know, even more drugs. And again, I mentioned Dr. Julie Bramer uh, at Hopkins. She did the phase one studies with nivolumab or Optivo. And I think everyone was blown away by the responses seen in that study. And again, no one expected it. No one expected it in this group of patients who had so many medical problems. Um, but now we have a lot of indicators uh, as to whether immunotherapy is going to be helpful. We've got the PD-1, PD-L1 receptor. We've got tumor mutational burden. Uh, we've got microsatellite instability. All of these things um, you know, can indicate whether we can manipulate the immune system to, to cure cancer in patients. In fact, it's interesting because it seems like the more mutations a patient has, the better immunotherapy works. So, for example, people who have smoked cigarettes tend to have a lot more mutations, mutational damage. Um, and this drug works best in those patients. So again, there's a lot of serendipity, a lot of, a lot of things that we thought, you know, academically we thought should work one way have ended up working another. And that's been really wonderful to see. I have one patient, a young man, he's in his mid-40s and he had lung cancer, he had a whole lung removed, he had chemotherapy and radiation, it came back in his liver, um, we took his, uh, it came back in his adrenal, we took his adrenal bout, he got radiation, he got chemotherapy, it started growing again, started spreading again, he got targeted therapy, um, and you know, it was growing again, and he's kind of a country guy, and he's like, Dr. Garst, I just want to take my little girl to Disney World. And I said, look, there's this new drug, I just want you to try it. No, I don't, I, I'm tired, I don't want to do anything else. And I said, please, just do it for me, let's just try it. It's immunotherapy, it was nivolumab. Um, I said, let's just, I said, we'll just do one dose, we'll just see if it does anything. So he, we gave him one dose, and lo and behold, he got extremely ill. He got horrible pneumonitis, and this guy has one lung, so he got inflammation in his only lung. Um, but we got him through that, we kept him out of the hospital, and then he disappeared on me. He took his little girl to Disney, and he didn't come back for his follow-up appointment. And I mean, he had big masses in his neck, and you know, cancer really, his PET scan lit up like a Christmas tree. So I kept calling him, and finally, he, he worked at a local car uh, dealership, and I had another patient who worked there, and I said, look, you tell him, you know, I'm looking for him. He needs, he needs to follow up with me. I'm, I'm not going to hold him down and give him any treatment, but I need to talk to him. So he picked up the phone the next time I called him. Uh, and I said, look, you, you need to come back in and just let me evaluate you. And he said, I feel great. That mass in my neck is gone. I don't have any pain. I can breathe great. I don't need to come back in. And I said, I said I'm not <laughs> I said, I'm not going to make you take any more tree. I'm not going to strap you down and put the needle in your arm, you know. I said, I just want to get a scan and let's just see. So he finally agreed. His, I think his wife made him come in. But anyway, we got a PET scan. And this man went from a PET scan that lit up like a Christmas tree to one where there was absolutely no activity. And this is the miracle that we can see with immunotherapy. Um, and that's been five years now. He got one dose of nivolumab five years later. So really just incredible, incredible advances. Um, so yeah, I hate to give chemotherapy these days. I like to find a target. We've got lots of ways to do that. We've got foundation one. We've got blood biopsies like Innovatas or there's a lot of other ones. Um, and so we have, we have ways of customizing care and that's so much better than the days of the rubber stamp carboplatin tax all for everybody, which is kind of what we were early on. We didn't even have that early on. So I think advocacy has made a huge impact on research, and thank goodness the research has moved forward. Um, interestingly, immunotherapy doesn't work that great in breast cancer, so you know, they, these are different diseases. The next thing I think is lung screening. It was always very frustrating to me that, you know, when I looked at the distribution of stage one, stage two, stage three, A, three, B, four, if I looked at that pie graph, I knew that, you know, 
roughly three quarters of the people who came into my office were not curable. And, you know, the fact that we did not have a way to detect lung cancer in its earliest stages was extremely frustrating. Um, but advocacy groups really made an impact, really made an impact on um, getting lung screening put through. Um, I remember we had, a, we had a meeting, again, Dr. Schiller organized this, and we had Dr. Claudia Hinchke speak. And uh, Dr. Hinchke started working on lung cancer screening 15 years before it made it to, you know, where insurance companies would cover it. And she had really, really compelling data. Um, and it just really, you know, it's like how much data do we need before insurance companies will pay for this? Um, so, but she was another woman who really, she didn't give up. She did not give up and she got advocacy groups behind her and we got the word out that screening worked um, and finally got a, a big, several big clinical trials that confirmed that lung cancer screening did um, decrease the risk of dying of lung cancer by about 20%, which at the time was better than any drug we had. Um, uh, but that's another kind of hero of mine who really, really didn't give up in the face of a lot of adversity and a lot of people saying that, oh yeah, well this isn't really significant. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with stigma. I mean, there is, a, and Dr. Schiller's gonna talk about this tomorrow, but you know, traditionally, and still now, there's a lot of nihilism about lung cancer. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've even for my own colleagues. I remember being in, in a thoracic conference one day and um, the radiologist throws up a film and this patient has a new lung mass who had had lung cancer, I don't know, three years before. Uh, and I asked if we could biopsy that lesion and she's like, why do you want to biopsy it? We know what it is. I'm like, well, no, I don't know what it is. You know, it's been three years. Um, and, and then she said, well, you don't have anything you can do anyway. And I said, well, that's not true. <laughs> we have second line chemotherapy. We could offer another surgery. I mean, this is someone who was in a lung cancer conference, all right? So there's a lot of nihilism around lung cancer. And one of the biggest problems, I think, with the stigma is we have to figure out how to reframe the image of lung cancer. Lung cancer is so frightening. When I think about kind of situations that mirror our, our situation with lung cancer, I think about the AIDS journey. So, you know, when AIDS first came out, oh my gosh, it was so scary and it was so foreign and, you know, it was, we didn't, no one knew how you got it and, you know, it got tacked onto a specific group of people and it was just this really horrible, frightening thing. We didn't have any information about it. But then, um, suddenly the name changed. We, we identified the HIV virus and all of a sudden it went from being AIDS to being HIV. Well, HIV isn't nearly as scary as AIDS is. You hear AIDS and you think death. Maybe not so much now, but back then you did. And then Magic Johnson got HIV. You know, he bled on the court and it was a big deal. And Arthur Ashe died of AIDS after getting a blood transfusion for a coronary artery bypass. Um, and then I forget, there was another celebrity whose wife got a blood transfusion while she was giving birth and got AIDS and died. I think it was uh, Glacier's wife. Um, but all of a sudden, anyone could get HIV and children and women and babies and, you know, if you were a body, you could get HIV. And so I think that's what we have to overcome with the lung cancer stigma. I wish we could rename the illness and market it differently. I think there's a lot to learn there. Um, so screening, screening is huge. Now people are getting screened, although not like they should be. You know, it's, it's, it's really shocking to me. And a lot of it is patients don't wanna be screened. There's, again, there's a lot of fear. Um, but just getting people to add lung cancer screening to your annual checklist. You know, you go to your primary care and you've got your, have you had your mammogram? Have you had your colonoscopy? Have you had your, you know, PSA checked? Well, frequently, lung cancer screening is not on that list still. It's not a required, like, checkoff. And it would be so easy, now that we have electronic medical records, 
it would be so easy to identify people aged 55 to 80 who smoked or still smoking. It would be so easy to identify those patients. Um, but we've been really, really slow as you know, institutions to, to make that happen. So we aren't screening nearly the number of people that we should be screening. But advocacy helped push that along and advocacy, I think, um, will help push that, that along even more. And so the third major change, I think, is lung cancer advocacy, because as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we didn't have any um, at the beginning of my career. Now we have major advocacy organizations like the North Carolina Lung Cancer Partnership, um, like the Lung Cancer Alliance that Al Case has morphed into, like Longevity and the Lung Cancer Foundation. These are major organizations. And interestingly, we have we have similar interests, but we've found our own little niches. Some people specialize in research, some people specialize in access, some special people specialize in the political aspect of lobbying. Um, so we really have most of the bases covered and we really have now a network or an infrastructure to work from and to be effective from. So, you know, my dream was always that our organization would be the Komen of lung cancer, and I still have that dream, and I think, we can, I think we can do this together. So you've played a major, major part in this journey. Um, again, I hope this weekend is uh, insightful. I hope we uh, light a fire in you to get out and, and try to make change and try to figure out what your skills are and what you can give and uh, how you can help. Um, we're going to hear a lot about lung cancer care, lung cancer um, stigma, and the obstacles. You know, we need to identify the obstacles, and then once you identify them, you can jump over them, right? Uh, like staging. But um, anyway, it's going to be a great, great event, and I'm so happy that uh, you spent your Friday evening to come out with us, and hope to see you tomorrow. And together, we can really, really, really make a change. Some of our um, early uh, PSAs about you know there's one with a model with a with a um, with a bikini model with like a chest X-ray you know if 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 people cared as much about their lungs you know we would be in a different situation things like that yeah um, but yeah there, there's a huge educational gap there and um, again I think you know we can come at it from both sides we can try to educate physicians and again healthcare systems because it was it would be so easy to identify who would be eligible for a lung cancer cat scan screening ct with our electronic medical record be a piece of cake you know same with smoking you know i i love I, I was at asco a few years ago and heard a great talk by a physician from kentucky who at their cancer center um, you have to literally opt out of smoking cessation counseling. You can't, it's not like opt in, do you want to get counseling? No, you get routed to smoking cessation counseling and you have to literally opt out of it, um, which is the way it should be, you know? Again, when we're talking holistically about health um, and, and your chances of surviving any cancer are certainly much better if you quit smoking. If you don't meet the high risk criteria, which is age 55 to 80, you have to have smoked a pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years, and either still be smoking or quit smoking within the past 15 years. That, that is the definition of high risk, and that's what Medicare will pay for for um, a screening CAT scan. If you don't meet those criteria, but you have some of what we call intermediate risks, so that would be people in your family who have lung cancer secondhand smoke exposure, either through your family, you know. I love to tell the story about my, all my, grand, my grandmother and all her sisters smoked. We would be, you know, I'd be trapped in the back seat of my Aunt Billy's Cadillac and they'd all be firing it up with the windows up, you know, and I'm like <coughs> dying in the back seat, you know. But secondhand smoke exposure, you know, you think of uh, people who worked in bars back before they were not smoking or, or even flight attendants or taxi cab drivers. Yeah, or spent a lot of time in bars. Um, you know, there's, that's a lot of closed um, exposure. I had one of my girlfriends who died of um, metastatic kidney cancer. Her dog got lung cancer. She lived in a very small, one bedroom apartment for years and smoked like a train and her dog got lung cancer. Um, so yeah, there are these intermediate risks, um, exposure, radon exposure, toxic exposures, um, 
and family members with lung cancer. And so if you have those intermediate risks, there are clinical trials, but they're not easy to find. Um, but if you have a cough that lasts more than three weeks, you are eligible for a CAT scan. So Medicare will pay, or insurance companies will pay for a chronic cough that lasts more than three weeks. And so you can insist, you can insist to your doctor if you have a symptom that's patient education. Though, that's patient education. A lot of times, you know, with asthma, you know, they're, yes. they're just thinking it's asthma. That's right. Or you're susceptible to getting bronchitis with a cough that's extended, right? Exactly. And I have many, many patients who've gone through, you know, three, four, five rounds of antibiotics before they even got a chest x-ray. So you have to advocate for yourself. But if you have a cough that lasts more than three weeks, you're eligible for a diagnostic CAT scan. Again, an organization like ours, we have, you know, we have mentoring, we have, we have advocates, we can put people together, uh, and there are different, a lot of the different advocacy groups have phone numbers and things you can call, but I think the best thing is to find somebody, you know, in your community or a neighbor. I mean, one in four people will get lung cancer, you know, so it's like um, there's, there's a lot of people around. Who, who can help guide you and, and help you figure out what to expect. Yeah. I think when it goes to stigma, I think there's a lot of fear associated. And you have, you know, a reminder in a person right in front of you that something bad could happen to any of us at any time or something life changing. Um, so again, we, gotta, we have to figure out ways to navigate that. But again, I, you know, every time we have a meeting and our survivors get up or I just look around the room, you know, that's, we are the face of lung cancer. I mean, look around this room, you know. We're, we're like, you know, every flavor, <laughs> you know, person here. And, um, and that's a beautiful thing. And I think, I, th I think diversity makes us stronger. And I think that, um, yeah. It's, it's great to have everyone here and we can reach every nook and cranny to help spread these important things we've talked about.